Uh, church family, glad you're here this morning. Hope you're glad to be here. We're excited to go to the Lord's Supper in a little bit. But before we do that, uh, we're just going to jump straight back into the book of Jonah. So if you've got your Bibles, I invite you to turn to the book of Jonah, chapter 3. Jonah, chapter 3. We've passed the halfway point in, in the book, and, and now we come to what is one of, one of the two critical moments here of the story. All right, we've seen that, that God comes to his prophet Jonah there in the northern kingdom of Israel. He tells Jonah, go, I've got a, I've got a word for you to cry against the city of, of Nineveh, that, that great city that's over there in Assyria. Go and cry against because their wickedness, their violence, their evilness has come up before me. I've been patient, I've given them time, but now it is time to respond to their wickedness with justice. And we saw Jonah uh, literally gets up and he goes the opposite way. He runs the opposite way. We see him go down and down and down and down and down until eventually he's down at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, crying out for salvation for life. And, and God brings deliverance. God grants him that salvation. God grants him life through a very smelly and probably very uncomfortable means of a, of a fish. Fish swallows him. He's in there three days and three nights. In this, he, he comes. He has a, a moment of response to the Lord. The fish vomits him up. And that's where we find ourselves right here. Look what it says with me, Jonah chapter 3. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. So here Jonah gets a second chance, a second opportunity and the word of the Lord comes and says, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. The words are strikingly similar to what we saw in, back in chapter 1, verse 2. He says literally, Jonah, get up now and go. Don't waste any time. Don't, uh, don't, don't go and figure out. Get up and go to Nineveh. Now, we don't know if there was a time lapse between Jonah being, being vomited up or not. I, I, I suspect there wasn't. He gets vomited back up. The word of the Lord comes to him. Arise, get up, and go. And, and by closest estimations, this journey to Nineveh, is, it's 500 miles from where jo the roundabout where Jonah would be. The fastest journey would take a month and a half, unless he had to walk the whole journey by foot. And if we just want to you know, use some conjecture today, if he spent his life savings to, to, to buy that boat to Tarshish, then he's probably walking it by foot. So it's going to at least take him a month and a half to go to Nineveh to, to make this proclamation. And we see Jonah arose, but instead of fleeing to Tarshish, Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. So Jonah gets up, he makes the journey to Nineveh. Now, I just remind you uh, the nature of Nineveh. Nineveh would have been a, a, an important, and, and it was not yet the capital of the Assyrian Empire, but it was an important diplomatic center. It was the, the location of the temple to Ishtar, the, the goddess they worshipped. It was a well-fortified city having an inner and outer wall, and that inner wall was, uh, was 50 feet wide by a hundred feet high, which really when you start to process that, realize that it's about a basketball and a court and a half wide, about a half a basketball court wide. It's a thick wall. In fact, until a few years ago when they were destroyed and fighting, you could still see some of the gates of Nineveh there in what is modern day Iraq. But as Jonah goes to Nineveh, let me, it's important we understand what's happened right prior to this. Nineveh, this prominent city of the Assyrian Empire, the Assyrians were the primary enemies of the northern kingdom of Israel where Jonah prophesied in the century prior. They were wicked, heinous people. We mentioned several weeks ago that really for me to, to even mention some of the basic atrocities that they committed would be too much with kids in the room. This is a wicked people. They are known for their brutality. Whereas other empires will rise up that are more powerful, other empires were, will conquer, other empires were far more gracious in how they dealt with the people they conquered. Assyria not only conquered you, but they absolutely devastated in every way. But for those people of Nineveh, they, they are living in a, a period there in the mid-8th century B.C., they are living in a period where their prominence, it has waned. 
The empire is not as powerful as it once was. There's been some battles that have been lost. In the prior decade before Jonah shows up, three, three things will happen. Two plagues will rip through the city, decimating it, bringing death and famine. In addition to that, there will be a complete total eclipse of the sun. And so as Jonah makes his way to Nineveh, what not even Jonah could know is there is likely in the city, there is a, a widespread feeling of tension, of what some would say, religious uncertainty. What, what is the reason for these things? What is happening There's there? And so he makes his way to Nineveh, but notice what it says. And I don't know if your Bible, mine has a note, but it says, now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. The, the little note, though, is literally in the Hebrew, Nineveh was a great city to God, which is a strange little statement, right? Because Nineveh, Nineveh doesn't worship God. So why, why is it a great city to God? Well, it's a great city to God twofold. One, this city that is known for its brutality, that is known for its wickedness, that is known for its worship of the things that are against God. It is still a city that falls under God's sovereign rule of the universe. It is still a city whose barriers and bounds are determined by the Lord, and it doesn't matter how much they rant and they rave. They cannot stop where the Lord has put their bounds. It's a good reminder even today as we think of uh, all throughout history and even today, cities that are synonymous with evil and threats and the worship of beings and things other than God, even those cities today, God is still God over. Not only that, but the fact that it's a great city to God is saying something of God's heart that these people, even these wicked people, these are people made in the image of God. There is an affection on the heart of God for these people. It's a great city to God. And so Jonah began to go through it. Three days walk. Now, many people don't know what to make do with three days walk. Does that mean that it would take you three days to walk around the city and then people get in? Well, how big was the city at that time? We know a later king made it bigger. There's a lot of different things. Here's what most likely... If you do the digging, it means is for Jonah to go through the city thoroughly and to proclaim the word of the Lord was going to take three days. It's going to take Jonah three days to make his way through the city to proclaim the word of the Lord. And it says that he began going on day one. So we're just barely into day one. He's entered through these large gates into this well-fortified and hostile and wicked city. He enters in and he, he cries out. And what is only five words in the Hebrew, he makes this proclamation, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. You can imagine this stranger, this foreigner who doesn't look like you, doesn't dress like you. He walks into the city and he's proclaiming, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. And that word overthrown is an interesting little Hebrew word because it carries with it a dual meaning. On one hand, it means what you would likely think it to mean. It, it, pictures, it pictures the, the overthrow, the toppling, the destruction, the annihilation of some place. It's, it's very similar to what we think of in Genesis with Sodom and Gomorrah. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown, it will be toppled, it will be destroyed. But that word also has a, another meaning, which refers to a person being transformed or changed, altered. If one is the overthrow of the external, the other would be the overthrow of the internal. So there he is. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, the people obviously take it to mean the, dis the destructive level. Look at what they say. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God. And they called a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least. And when the word reached the king of Nineveh, he, he arose from his throne. He laid aside the robe from him. He covered himself in sackcloth and set on the ashes. He issued a proclamation, and the proclamation said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let a man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast will be covered with sackcloth, and let men call on God earnestly, vehemently, passionately, that each 
may turn from their wicked way and from the violence which they have committed with their own hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. So Jonah walks in. He makes this proclamation. He's barely in the city one day's journey. He makes this proclamation, and it says that the people of Nineveh believed. Believed. The people of Nineveh on edge, the people of Nineveh, these, these wicked people that if you had sat down at a missions conference back over in the northern kingdom of Israel and said, where can we go that people would be receptive of the message? It wouldn't be Nineveh. Yet it says the Ninevites believed, they trusted, they heard this word, and they believed, they accepted it as true. Literally, they faithed the word. They placed faith in the word. And they began responding out of, out of that faith. They, they call for a fast. They put on sackcloth. They begin to, to abstain from, from food. And they begin to shed whatever garments, whatever statuses, whatever external appearances showed varying hierarchy. They shed it all, and they were all great to least wearing sackcloth, a sign and a symbol of brokenness, of sorrow. Not only this, but this, this movement, they're not even on day one. Understand, Jonah hasn't even had enough time to make it into the center of the city. And it doesn't say that Jonah's word reached the king, but it says that, that word from the people, this, this movement, there is an awakening stirring all across the people of Nineveh. And this awakening comes and it, it reaches the, the, the king. And literally that word reach, it, it pierces. There's the king looking out. You can imagine from his palace looking out on the city and he can tell there's, there's murmuring, there's stirrings, and all of a sudden word gets to him and it strikes him, it touches him, it afflicts him violently, suddenly. It's the message of God. It pierces his heart as he realizes with the people and he sees what the people are already doing and understand his proclamation doesn't direct the people and what they haven't already started. His proclamation is a follow-up to what the people have started. He says, look, not just people should we fast and our fasting shouldn't just be food, but no person or animal should eat or drink a thing. You know, why animals? Well, animals show certainly the fullness, the magnitude, the desperation with which they are seeking to, to communicate with God. But, but, but much bigger than that, in the book of Jonah, we've seen all sorts of animals. We've seen the fish. Now we see the cattle. We're going to see more in chapter 4 next week. And it's a reminder of this. That when it comes to a man's sin, sin does not just break you and I as image bearers of God, but it breaks all creation. The consequences for sin are over all creation. It's why Paul in Romans 8 will make the statement that creation waits eagerly, longing for the Lord to return. Joel in his prophecy says, how the beasts groan. The herds of cattle wander aimlessly because there's no pasture for them. The flocks of sheep suffer. To you, O Lord, I cry. And it says, even the beasts of the field pant for you. All of a sudden, it's not just the magnitude, but the reality that the sin and wickedness of Nineveh, it hadn't just broken them. It's broken all around them. Not only are man and animal not to eat or to drink and to put on sackcloth to show themselves, to humble themselves, but then it says that each man may call on God earnestly with strength, with force, with passion, that each person call on God, that each person begin crying out, not only that, but as they call on God, that each may turn. And here's another key word. If, if, this, if this awakening has started in belief, they have believed, then where it's moving is now the call is to turn, or the word for you and I would be to Repent. The call is now for the people to repent, to acknowledge that they are walking this way in this kind of wickedness, and to turn, to acknowledge that they are responsible, it says, to turn from the wickedness and the violence of their own hands. There is an acknowledgement of each individual's guilt 
in the wickedness of the land. And they call to turn, and not just turn from it, but turn to God. And this question comes, who knows? That very question is asked 10 times in, in the Hebrew Old Testament, and this is the only time it's asked by a Gentile. It's one of only two times where the question of who knows, maybe God will relent, it's only one of twice where the destruction that God says is coming, God pulls back because of the response of the people. Who knows, maybe God will, will turn, maybe he will relent, and there's a play that word relent, that word turn, it's the same as the word for repent. When it's applied to humans, it means to repent. It doesn't mean to repent when applied to God because God's not guilty and in need of repentance. What it does mean is God relents. He pulls back something that is promised. And his burning anger, now maybe when you hear burning anger, you all of a sudden get this impression of a bull in a china closet. Or if you're a young person, you get the impression of the rage monster from the Dude Perfect videos. Someone just swinging a bat, clearing everything out, just no sanity, just driven by anger. That's, that's not, though, what the words mean. What the words reference is a deep, internal, settled, strong, and yes, passionate disposition against sin. Here's, here's what it's stating, that sin is not casual to God. There is a deep and intense stance against sin. Who knows? Maybe God will turn. And then in a passage that starts out with potential doom, look where we end here in verse 10. When God saw their deeds. And by the way, just pause. Realize the magnitude of that. The Ninevites aren't the chosen people of God. They are wicked they're vile. In fact, they've actively opposed the people of God. But God's not just the God of Israel. He's the God over all creation. He sees all things. He knows all things. And his eyes there are upon the Ninevites when God sees their deeds. And look at what it specifies, church family, as their deeds. That they turned from their wicked way. It doesn't say when, when God saw all of their fasting and, and all of their sackcloth no, it's when God saw that there was repentance, when God saw that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. God Almighty, looking down here at the city of Nineveh, a city that does not honor him as God, but nonetheless he is God over because he is God over all creation. A city that will give account to God not because they honor God, but because all men must give an account to their creator. A city that's great in the heart of God. A city that God sends a prophet on an unusual journey to go. A city that rightfully has earned and deserved the wrath of God, the destruction that God is going to bring. But a city who hears a word and believes who in that belief acts, and in that action repents. And all of a sudden we come to the end of the passage and God sees their belief and their repentance and his response is to pull back from the destruction and in pulling back from the destruction, as we'll see next week, he shows mercy, compassion, grace, and deliverance. We watch this passage move from one way to another. We watch this passage move as God reveals the seriousness of sin. The seriousness of sin and the seriousness of his judgment on sin. He reveals this through his prophetic servant and the word spoken. But he just doesn't just reveal the seriousness of sin and his judgment. He reveals the magnitude of his mercy and compassion upon the people of Nineveh when they repent seriousness of his sin, the, seri the seriousness of their sin, the seriousness of his judgment on sin, the magnitude, the desire even to, to demonstrate mercy and compassion. And, and church family, we must not miss what we see today. We must not miss the heart of God. There's two aspects we can't miss. One is we've got to see clearly the heart and character of God in the passage. 
We find uh, all throughout, we've gone through our series Godology on Wednesday nights, and, and, and we see this statement in Scripture that God is holy, holy, holy. And that word holy meaning one who is certainly morally pure, but, but it flows out of one who is entirely unique and distinct. There is no one like God. He is holy, holy, holy. And God in his holiness, church family, he is righteous and just with regard to sin. He is righteous and just. He says there's a calamity coming on Nineveh. He tells Jonah to get up. Their wickedness has come up against me. God is a just God who takes sin seriously. And, and the sin and the wickedness of the Ninevites, he has shown patience. He has allowed time. There has been no response. And so now the word comes. There, there's a, a danger, a disaster coming as a result of Nineveh's sin and church family the reality is there is calamity that comes as a result of our sin. We know from the New Testament the wages of sin is death. What does sin, if you and I by nature are sinners, and because we are by nature born as sinners, we commit sin, what does that sin earn us? Death. The earnings of sin is death. We also know this, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none who is righteous, no, not one. Understand every single human being created, loved, made in the image of God, but born in iniquity, born out of relationship with God. And the rightful punishment upon our sin, the actual acts of our sin, is death. It is judgment in that way. God's heart and God's heart in that, ju in that judgment is not some kind of Stoic, Puritan, spewing hatred, but it is a just and right judgment. When you find someone guilty of a crime and a, and a jury convicts them justly of that crime and the judge passes down that sentence, no one looks at that judge and goes, how dare that just horribly angry judge? We all celebrate that justice was done. The challenge with justice over our sin is the fact that every one of us are the ones who are guilty and therefore deserving of the judgment. And that's not a popular message in today's world, but it's one, listen, the people of Nineveh do not respond if they are not confronted with the fact that in their sin they are in danger of the judgment of God. Now, church family, as we understand that, as those of us who have been saved by grace through faith, what we need to understand is we also need to very, be very careful how we communicate the judgment of God. There is a way to communicate that God is a righteous and just God who will, who will faithfully and correctly judge and deal with sin that is both loving and gracious and a way to do it that is fire and brimstone. There is one way to do it where people will hear and another way to do it which it just seems demeaning. And God's judgment here is not demeaning, it's just true. But we don't only see God's righteousness and justice towards sin. Because God is holy, he is also merciful and compassion, compassionate toward all nations. Remember the word, when, when God passes by Moses, on the mountain there in Exodus 34, he makes this statement, the Lord passed by and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, who is compassionate and gracious, who is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Because God is holy, he is not just righteous and just in his judgment to sin, but because God is holy, 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 he is merciful and compassionate towards sinners of all nations. You see, what was ultimately God's heart? Remember the, the dual nature of that word, overthrown. On one hand, you see judgment. Overthrown can mean destruction. But on the other hand, overthrown can mean transformation, change, alteration. It can refer to, to one's heart being altered and changed and, and transformed. We see all throughout the word, church family, that God's heart is for his salvation to reach all nations. Genesis 1.26, God makes all people in his image. Every man, woman, boy, or girl of every culture, of every tribe, of every nation, every last one is made in the image of God. We know from Genesis 12 when God calls Abraham and the beginning of the people of Israel 
comes to fruition, his statement in that covenant with Abraham is that your people will be a blessing to all nations. The way they'll be a blessing is through the chosen Messiah who comes and that chosen Messiah, Jesus, when he's there with the disciples on the mountaintop, what does he commission them to? Go and make disciples of all nations. Panta ta ethne, and when we say all nations, we don't mean geopolitical boundaries, we mean each and every people group. That's what we mean by the statement, all nations, panta ta ethne, that's the, the language in the Greek, all nations. There is not a single man, woman, boy, or girl living on this planet today that is not made in the image of God, that God does not love, that God does not desire to see his salvation come. And church family, because God is holy, he is righteous and just, he is merciful and compassionate, and when all those things come together, we find his desire is that people would repent and respond to his gift of life. Now, you can turn with me or you can, just, you can just mark it, but I want you to mark this because I realize we live in a day where people go, wow, the God of the Bible, when you talk about judgment, Pastor, man, that's just harsh. Man, why is your God in the Old Testament so, so harsh on this? Listen to Ezekiel chapter 33. This is God speaking, verse, verse 10. Now, as for you, son of man, say to the house of Israel... Thus you have spoken. So he says, he says, prophet, I want you to say to Israel, this is what you've said. The Israelites are saying this, surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us and we are rotting away in them. How can we survive? Woe is us, there's no hope for us. Verse 11, God says, say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But rather that the wicked turn from his way and live, turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Understand, church family, when we speak of a holy God who is righteous and just in his judgment of sin, who is merciful and compassionate in his, in his response to sinners of all nations, understands because at the core of God's heart is a heart that desires life. When a person rejects the gospel message of Jesus Christ and dies in their trespasses and sins, and they stand before the Lord guilty and the Lord hands down the eternal sentence of separation from God, the eternal sentence of hell, it is not with joy in his heart, but sorrow. That's what he says there in Ezekiel. I take no pleasure in it. Why will you? And understand, that's, that's the choice there. God sees the, the deeds of the Ninevites. He sees that they have believed his word. He sees that they have repented of their sin, and he relents. His relenting is in response to their response of his word. And that response is of all people. Here's what's interesting in the passage. Nineveh, you had poor, you had wealthy, you had everybody in between. And at the end of the day, every single one of them, regardless of status, wealth, fame, fortune, talent, whatever thing you want to throw in there, regardless, all of them were in sackcloth crying out. Because the reality that all are sinners, it's the ultimate equalizer. doesn't matter from the viewpoint of humanity how good or bad you are. Everybody's equal before the Lord. We're all sinners in need of grace. And praise the Lord that God's heart is such that he has acted in the person and work of Jesus Christ to send the one who could take our sin, who could live in the life that we have failed to live, who can go to the cross and become our sin because God is just, our sin must be punished. And Jesus became our sin on the cross, the sin for all the world, every man, boy, or girl that ever lived. He is the propitiation for all the world, the atoning sacrifice. And he drank the punishment that you and I rightly deserve, every last drop. So that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. So that whosoever would confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in his heart that God raised him from the dead, he will be saved. 
See, church family, don't miss the character and the heart of God. We serve a, a just and righteous God who is merciful and gracious, who is, who is patient, who is long-suffering, who seeks to save men and women. And today is the day of salvation because Christ has come. He has lived, he has died, and he has risen. This is the heartbeat that we see this, the character of God here. So what are you and I to do? We don't want to miss God's character, but we also then need to respond rightly in light of his character. So we're considering his righteous and judgment. Church family, we must repent from our sins. We must believe his word and repent from our sins. Jesus uses the, the people of Nineveh as an example to the Pharisees. The Pharisees say, hey, we want a sign. Prove to us you're the Messiah. Forgetting the fact of all the other miracles and things we've seen, show us a sign. And Jesus says, you wicked and perverse generation, I'm not going to show you a sign. The only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. Three days in the belly of a well, so the son of man, three days in the belly of the earth. And then he makes this statement. The people of Nineveh will rise up at judgment and will condemn this generation. The people of Nineveh who heard five words and believed five words and fell to their knees and repented, not knowing who God is, not knowing if God, you notice Jonah? Jonah doesn't say God is merciful and compassionate and he'll, he'll relent if, if, if you respond. They, they don't know anything. They just know they've upset God. They know that they're, that they're out of alignment with God and so they seek to respond any way they can. They repented at five words from a prophet that, in my opinion, and we'll look at this at next week, went in and did a half-hearted job proclaiming the message. Yet how many of us have heard the truth clearly, have seen the word, have read the word, have seen like the Pharisees who right there, Jesus standing in front of them, yet refused to ever believe? Understand. There is not salvation in any of our works. The reason God relented, it's a place that relented so when he saw their deeds, but what deed does it mention? The fact that in their believing his word, they repented. Not that they threw on sackcloth and ash, not that all of a sudden they erected a church and they said for the next 40 days we'll have flawless church attendance and we'll get out our, our Hebrew scrolls and read our Bibles every day. It's not because of anything they did, it's because they responded to his word. They responded to conviction. That's what repenting is, church family. Repenting is walking in this direction and turning. And for anyone who is not repented in faith and trusted Christ, hear and see the word today. Upon the conviction of your sin, you're out of alignment, you're not in relationship with the Lord. That in fact, your sin is actually deserving of a just and right sentence of guilt. But God sent Jesus who took your place, whose blood is still good to cover you. But that response has to be a, Lord, I am walking in the way of sin. I acknowledge that you are Lord, you are right. I am turning to you because you are right, and I am trusting the full weight of my being, not on what I can do or could ever do for you, but on what you have done for me in Jesus Christ. That is biblical repentance and faith. That is how biblical salvation comes. And I just encourage you, just on a side note, parents in the room, as you pray for salvation in the life of your kids, please make sure you understand repentance is not magic words. If I just say the magic prayer, God saves me like a vending machine, pop in two quarters and out pops the can of salvation. Repentance needs to come with conviction. I'm so grateful for parents that when I could quote off the gospel to them but had no evidence of conviction of sin in my life, said, Wes, you're not ready to ask Jesus to save you. Because I sure do remember when the Holy Spirit brought that kind conviction to my heart that that gospel message I could rattle off really was for me because I really was guilty and, and needed Jesus to save me. Repentance and conviction go hand in hand. There should be conviction if we are going to repent. And in light of God's justice, his righteousness, if we find ourselves by nature a sinner, 
out of alignment with God, the call today is to repent. And here's the incredible news. When you and I respond in repentance and faith, God delights to save. And he's really good at it. He never fails. He does exactly what he promises he will do. But to those of us who say, well, pastor, that's awesome. Praise the Lord for an evangelistic sermon. But, but what about us who have responded in repentance and faith? What does is, what is Jonah 3 speak to us? What aspect? Well, one, we need to be clear on this because we're going to be interacting and leading people and telling people the gospel. They need to know that there is a response of repentance and faith. But understand, church family, when we consider his mercy and compassion toward all nations, then you and I must make sure we proclaim those his excellencies to all nations. First Peter chapter two says, you were once not a people, you once had not received mercy, but now you are his people, now you have received his mercy, and it makes this statement, therefore we must proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into marvelous light. Church family, going back to two weeks ago, there is a call in Christ. You and I have been called to make disciples. You and I have been called to be Christ's witnesses, and we have been called to do it to all nations. You and I, church family, have a calling to proclaim the excellencies of him who saved us. You see, you and I, we were once in the position of those Ninevites. We were once in that place where we had not received mercy, where we were lost and without hope. And now we have experienced saving grace, and we haven't just experienced it past tense, but we experience his grace and mercy afresh every day, whether we're aware of it or not, whether we're in line with him in right fellowship, walking faithfully, or whether we've strayed. And because you and I can rest in his mercy, because you and I have life out of his mercy and grace, you and I are called to proclaim. We're called to proclaim regardless of eloquence. Well, pastor, I just, I, I, I don't know that I can, I don't know that I can share. Listen, 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 brothers and sisters. If you and I know enough of the gospel to be saved, we know enough of the gospel to proclaim. Because if we don't know how to proclaim how we were in fact saved, then we, we, maybe we need to go back and look at salvation. Paul said, I, I, I chose not to come and, and, and try to be eloquent so that you'd be twisted by wise words of plausible speech. Instead, I just came and I, in humility and I chose to know Christ and Christ crucified. God is not looking for eloquence. God is looking for faithfulness. So we proclaim regardless of how eloquent we feel or not feel. We proclaim regardless of the response we see or don't see. Listen, church family, the gospel message is still powerful because God is still sovereign. He's on his throne. The blood of Christ is still effective just as much today as it was at Pentecost 2,000 years ago. And the Holy Spirit is still active and moving in and through this world to bring conviction. The city of Nineveh is the last place you and I would ever have expected a spiritual awakening to happen in that day. Yet the Lord was doing things. The Lord was doing things in the years prior to move and stir the hearts of the Ninevites to be at a place where they were ready to hear. Church family, when we look out at the world today, it is so tempting Fewer people are going to church. More young people are abandoning the faith. Our culture is getting more secular. Things seem to be turning this direction. Church family, we cannot lose hope. We must proclaim the gospel of Christ regardless of response that we see because God is still on the move. He hasn't stopped. But we also have to realize he is on the move and he takes his time Ninevites weren't ready for that moment 10 years prior, but after 10 years of God doing a lot of stuff, they were ready for that moment. That person, that friend, that family member you may be sharing with today, it may be 10 years from now before they're ready, so don't lose hope. Sometimes when we see the lack of response, perhaps it's because we, we have this tendency to only think we need to go after a certain kind of person. Did you notice in the passage? The king's not the one where revival starts. It's the crowd. The people. 
The average, ordinary, everyday people, they're the ones responding to awakening. It's their response to awakening that when the word gets to the king, it pierces his heart. And oftentimes what we do is we have this mentality of, man, if we could, if we could just see the quarterback come to faith in Christ, the whole school follow. Well, that's horrible on a lot of levels. If they're only following because he's the quarterback, they're not following because Jesus is Jesus. What if God, to win the high school to Christ, doesn't want to use the quarterback? What if God wants to use the chess club? Now, I'm not knocking chess clubs. I was part of one back in the day, so I, I can use that example. My point is simply this, church family. When we think about our nation and our world in desperate need of spiritual awakening, we gotta stop thinking, we gotta just reach the leaders, and we gotta start reaching the everyday people right in front of us that God has put in our path and not lose hope, but proclaim the gospel whether there's response or not. Because God likes to move through the most unlikely of places, and we need to understand this as we proclaim, church family, we proclaim the good news of our God regardless of differences. Jonah had to go walk into the city of his nation's most bitter enemies, a nation that had pillaged and plundered Israel. Yet God's heart was just as much for Nineveh as it was for anywhere else. Church family understand political, ethnic, familial, economic, those kind of differences, we do not get to pick and choose who hears the gospel. We do not get to pick and choose based on the kind of people with potential and charisma we want our team. Make no mistake, Jesus died for everyone. And you and I don't get to decide based on our own preferences who gets to hear or not. No, we just get to go. We get to go because church family, God is moving, God is stirring. Who knows? Who are those Ninevites today that God is stirring and moving in ways we haven't seen, that God would open up a door for us to even in five short words share, can I just tell you, Jesus saved me. Who knows what could happen? Who knows what awakening could go from that single moment? Because God is a God who saves and that's what we're going to come to the table in a moment and celebrate. So if you'd with me, bow your heads, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, you are on the move. You are good. God, it is easy to lose hope. But we lose hope because we put our focus on the wrong things. God, I would have been one guilty if Jonah came to me and said, hey, I think I'm supposed to go to Nineveh and share the gospel. I would have said, man, that's a waste of your time. There's no way they respond. Oh, but Lord, they did. Father, you are on the move. There is no reason to give up hope. You are sovereign. Jesus, your blood is good in spirit. You are still active and convicting. May we be faithful to go and proclaim. And Lord, as we come to this time of response, if there's any who've not responded to you in salvation, may today be the day, the day of their new birth in you. God, and for those of us who know your salvation, may we have open hands and willing hearts. May our answer be yes. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.